Hey, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. As promised, I'm taping from Chicago this week. Uh, I'll be here for much of the coming month. And um, now I know everybody is thinking about the fact that Israel has just gone crazy, plum lost its mind, as they say. Um, but uh, we're, I'm going to talk about that separately in my news analysis uh, this week. And I wanted to talk about something, as, as Monty Python would say, now for something completely different. Um, Israel has actual enemies, not just pretend ones that, you know, vote for different parties. Um, and first and foremost among them is Lebanon, which is controlled by the Iranian Foreign Legion in Lebanon, otherwise known as Hezbollah. And, um, you know, we uh, before uh, sort of the left's temper tantrum rose to its current crescendo, uh, the news for a few days, we were allowed to think about the fact that the northern border is really uh, heating up and Hezbollah has uh, put a tent in Israeli uh, territory and a whole bunch of other things, which I want to talk about with my guests this week and people who, who have been watching this show. Uh, for a while, and you should all have been watching this show for a while, but if you haven't, welcome. Uh, I'm going to speak today with uh, my friend Tony Badran from the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. Um, and Tony, uh, first of all, welcome back to the Carolyn Glick Show. Thanks very much, Carolyn. It's always a pleasure. So uh, I said to Tony, we were, we were supposed to do this last week, and then uh, you know things went crazy in Israel, so I said, why don't we postpone it? And um, but things are changing in terms of getting better on the northern border with Lebanon. And so Tony knows Lebanon better than anybody I know. Um, Tony, can you just first of all describe what is going on from the Lebanese perspective? What are they doing? Um, we have the tent. We have a bunch of cross-border penetrations. They were they were pointing at an Israeli tank with an RPG. Um, so uh, how, how would you describe it? Okay, so I the 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 current escalation or campaign, and it's a concerted campaign, which I'll explain in a second. So the the current campaign actually goes back uh, to March of this year. You'll remember what happened in March of this year. This was when uh, Hezbollah sent a bomber to the Megiddo Junction in Israel to try and blow up. Uh, a, uh, targets there, civilians, and then uh, there was an altercation uh, following that um, you know, with with uh, one in, person in Lebanon. was killed, and it was an Correct. IED that could have really caused massive damage, but it was sort of a dud or right. or something. It went off too early. Whatever it was, it was a it was a miracle that only one person was killed by the blast. Right, and it is the IED that kind of gave away that this was a Hezbollah uh, operation. And and the IDF assessed that this that this bomber came from Lebanon and uh, infiltrated through Lebanon. And so this was um, a continuation of a, uh, a campaign or a new method that Hezbollah was, was, uh, was reintroducing, which is the use, the tactical use of the Lebanese front against Israel short of a... Uh, uh, all-out war, right? And that goes back to 2021, when the Biden administration came into power, and then Hamas uh, and uh, and the Islamic Jihad uh, started a war uh, in in 2021, and that saw the first uh, reintroduction of Lebanon as an arena, as Hezbollah and the Iranians both announced that now whatever happens in Jerusalem and the West Bank can be responded to from Lebanon as well. So they, they tested it, they tested it out and, uh, they saw a very reluctant Israeli response. In fact, a lot, uh, the IDF messaged quite openly that they didn't believe Hezbollah was really responsible. They may have been Palestinians, maybe even Palestinians against Hezbollah's will and so on. So the point of the message was we don't want to change the status quo. So then fast forward, then you get another, um, a very relevant uh, event to the current campaign that's happening now on the border, uh, which is the negotiation of the ma over the maritime uh, borders that the administration wanted to get done for the sake of uh, Lebanon's uh, prosperity and security, as they as they put it, and they waited 
until uh, Yair Lapid assumed the premiership. On the day he assumed the premiership, Hezbollah launched drones against the Karish offshore platform. Uh, this is during the negotiations that were taking place. Uh, instead of the Israelis pulling away from the negotiations, the United States says you need to do this now and you need to finish it now, and they do. So that was a second major dent to Israeli deterrence. Then we fast forward again, and now in the spring again, we that, get- That gas deal, just, just to be clear, and I, I wrote about this. You were supposed to write about it. I didn't see the article, but um, that the uh, the gas deal that the United States compelled the outgoing Lapid government, this was during a transition period before the election, after the Lapid Bennett government had lost the no confidence election. So this was crazy, like right before an election, they did this. Um, and they compelled Israel to surrender, I think it was 840 nautical miles of Israel's economic waters and territorial waters and the entirety of the gas uh, platform, the Kana gas platform, worth a, a, you know, a, a set value of many, many tens of billions of dollars and having a, a presence for Hezbollah, IRGC, in the Eastern Mediterranean, courtesy of uh, the United States of America. Right. So all the details of this are very relevant to what's going on, and, and we'll get to those in a second. I just want to establish a timeline of what happens. So we're now we see 2022, and then 2023, we get another spring of 2023. We get another episode of rocket launches, again, as, as stuff starts heating up in, in, in the West Bank and so on. Now, Hezbollah having seen that the IDF did not respond last time, they upped the ante. They increased the numbers of the rocket. The rockets now actually made it across the border as opposed to the last time they most of them kind of landed either in the Mediterranean or empty places. Now now they're actually uh, are getting uh, to their targets. And then you get also the Megiddo, like I said, the Megiddo uh, bombing. So now you have an, a, a, a stream of new uh, uh, attacks from Lebanon to which the, uh, the IDF does not respond meaningfully in Lebanon. They shoot empty uh, fields or whatever, or they hit in Syria, which is kind of the agreed um, uh, uh, sort of mailbox, if you like. You know, if, if whatever happens, we'll just stay in Syria. We will not light up the Lebanese front. Uh, and so Hezbollah is now capitalizing on this, on both these things, on this seeming self-deterrence by the IDF on the one hand against any uh, operation in Lebanon, and two, at the precedent that the Biden administration established with the maritime deal, which is which is what which it, that it planted itself in between Israel and Hezbollah, and uh, when and discouraged Israel from taking any action, and it encouraged Israel to give concessions, uh, whether economic or territorial, it doesn't matter. Um, I will just make a quick note here that I'll return to later. Uh, remember when the Lapid government was touting the deal as, as as a major achievement, one of the things that they pointed to was that they retained the buoy line, which is a line of, that extends from uh, Rosh Mikra to about five kilometers out to sea. Uh, and then, uh, so that kind of prevents um, any infiltration and, and any uh, direct light of sight for Hezbollah to do that. And that was... You know, they, they claim uh, uh, an Israeli official at the time uh, on background told reporters that this is this constitute uh, uh, an, in, an an recognition now enshrined in an international in international law of the border and Israel's retention. That was an, a bald faced lie because the very text of the deal said that actually it does not prejudice. The deal does not prejudice Lebanon's claim to the point on land at Rosh Nikra from which this boy starts. Now, it's very important because that point was referenced by Hassan Nasrallah and Nabi Hibiri, his, his, his ally, the Speaker of Parliament in Lebanon, as one of the points that they are demanding uh, Israel pull back from. And they're asking the United States again to intervene uh, in uh, as a mediator, as it did, to compel Israel to withdraw if they want Hezbollah to pull back their tents from from uh, from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from back behind the blue line, right? So these are so, again. So what they're taking? 
they're taking, yes. So they're taking, uh, we'll get to Vajar in a second as well. So we're, they're taking the model and, and Nasrallah in a speech on marking the 2006, uh, the anniversary of the 2006 war on July 12th, was very explicit in this regard. He said very openly, you know, he drew an analogy to the maritime border, like the, you know, Hezbollah launched drones, Hawkstein came, we got what we wanted. Now we put the tents, Hawkstein comes, and the expectation is that now they will carry, uh, uh, the Americans will carry their demands for them to the Israelis and under the, uh, you know, justified, as a move to de-escalate, to not jeopardize the, ma the maritime deal, to not jeopardize economic gains in Israel, to not pressurize the region, especially because it's also the Lebanese uh, are supposed to start, you know, the French and the Qatari companies um, that, that got the bids are supposed to start, uh, I think, in August or September, their, their, uh, their operations in Lebanese water. So they're going to push that, hey, let, don't try to remove them by force. Keep everything so quiet. So I think what's important here is to point out that what we're talking about, again, is a corollary and an extension. So the United States coerced the Lapid government, which was an interim government, just weeks before the election of uh, November 1st of last year, to succumb to Hezbollah demands in total, complete collapse of the Israeli position and this was an issue that had been on the negotiating table, for better or for worse, since the Obama administration, since I think 2011. So it had been on the table for over a decade, and it had been a stale. And then in comes the Biden administration, weeks before the election, coerces a transition government, an interim government, to succumb to every single one of Hezbollah's demand that successive Israeli governments had refused to succumb to for over a decade. And then on the eve of the elections, uh, Yair Lapid collapses. And now, and we'll get to the, uh, the, the U.S. role in exacerbating the situation on the ground in Israel today to destabilize the Netanyahu government uh, 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 in just a few minutes. But um, what we see here is an attempt to repeat what they did at sea on land. And so it's a line that goes across uh, the frontier of Israel and Lebanon on border, beginning at Rosh Nikra and extending uh, into the Golan Heights. So um, um, talk a little bit now maybe just about what what it is, what's the territorial claim uh, it's not it's not correct, but let's we'll put that out there now at a starting point. We can look into it in the, in in a, in a bit, but but what exactly are we talking about in terms of the the land the land? So so let me just start by saying that whoever at the time of the maritime deal claimed that the maritime deal and the board land border uh, dispute were separate and not connected uh either didn't know what they're talking about or wasn't being honest because the fact of the matter is the lebanese before uh before um agreeing to enter can you imagine they agreed they had to agree to enter into something that would benefit them right before agreeing they were conditioning uh, the restarting of the uh, of the talks this is under the trump very misguided uh, Trump, uh, uh, Pompeo State Department in particular, but even before that, uh, you know, they were they were trying to, uh, they were conditioning their return to negotiations on the inclusion uh, by the, uh, the uh, recognition by the U.S. of a second related track to, to, to uh, resolve the Lebanese claims to the land border, uh, to, the, to the blue line, because they dispute certain points along the blue line. And of course, the other ones in the Golan, which which nobody other than them recognizes as Lebanese, and we'll get to those in a second. Right. But so that 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 condition was essential. And when they launched, when the United States agreed to launch the talks in in uh, announced rather the talks in 2020, they agreed. And if you go back and read Secretary Pompeo's announcement of the talks, it includes, you know, uh, we look forward to a separate you know track that does 
It doesn't matter what how the Trump uh, and, and the Pompeo State Department conceptualized their own language. The Lebanese had a different idea, and certainly Team Biden had a different idea as well. And the 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 point about uh, resolving the land border was also incl- uh, referenced in the text of the agreement that that point at Rosham Mikra is not pre- does not prejudice Lebanese claim, which should be uh, resolved later in a, in a separate you know Lebanese um, uh, when when the Lebanese and the Israelis resolve their border disputes, right? So that was already baked into the maritime. Now, um, in September 2022. Uh, as they were negotiating this deal, the Lapid government uh, builds a fence on the northern part of around the northern part of Gaza. Now, the problem is that the village of and Gaza, Roger, which is just the Gola- to be clear, Rajar is a is a is a village that um, had been entirely under Israeli control until Israel removed its forces from Lebanon in uh, May 2000, and then the UN compelled Israel to uh, remove itself from the northern half, essentially, of the town. And so you have because one town- Because the blue line runs across it. The blue line right. runs across that uh, that uh, that town, right? All so of the people who part. live in Rajar are Israeli citizens. Correct. They're, they're, they were never Lebanese. They were, uh, you know, so, the, the, so Rajar is part of the Golan Heights. And once in 1981, the Golan Heights was uh, was annexed, so they 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 uh, they I think they got uh, uh, they were offered Israeli citizenship, and and they could uh, they, they could uh, part- participate in uh, you know as citizens. And now the thing is, what happened? Um, like you said, this was never an issue because this did not concern Lebanon. This was a Golan Heights uh, uh, village, um, and once Israel decra- declared sovereignty, you know this is this. Is, the Lebanese have absolutely nothing there, right? The only reason it becomes Lebanon is because the United Nations, in its as it drew, as it used maps, some say faultly, uh, you know, uh, erroneously, uh, drew the line uh, that that cuts that northern part. It doesn't matter the technicalities. The point is, for better or worse, uh, Israel, in its commitment to the blue line, committed that this part was actually the northern part was part of Lebanon, and it. And only the southern part is 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 part of Israel, and that's the only place that 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 still has this this tension. And the United Nations, you know, in its reports about uh, seventeen uh, resolution seventeen oh one and the the implementation of it in in Lebanon, constantly references that Israel needs to withdraw whatever. So Hezbollah knows, and and Hassan Nasrallah ref made this point in his speech that this everyone there is no dispute about the northern part of Gaza, right? Everyone recognizes this as Lebanese territory. So he understands that this is his strongest entry point. That's the wedge that he's going to use because that's where he has the strongest standing. So that's why he's demanding very specifically an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. That's his very specific ask. And that's what he's tasking the Lebanese government to give to Hochstein. And according to reports, that's exactly what Hochstein relayed to the Israelis, that you should withdraw from the northern part of Gaza in return for Hezbollah with pulling their tents. Now, the problem is that the northern part of Gaza was from the period between 2000 and 2006, like everything else in Hardov and in that area, was an arena for Hezbollah attacks after the Israeli withdrawal, after the Israeli withdrawal, right? That's when they invented, uh, Hezbollah invented the notion of um, uh, Lebanese, a Lebanese claim to the Shaba Fars, the Kfar Shuba Hills, uh, and and obviously Gaza separately because the UN agreed with that. So um, that uh, the UN does not agree with the Shaba Farms and the Kfar Shubal. Nobody does. That's that's just uh, uh, that's just the Lebanese, right? So uh, not even the Syrians, not even the Syrians have agreed to uh, present proof that this is Lebanese territory and and so on. So it is completely uh, it's a false claim and, and it doesn't it's not real. Uh, but he's using it anyway. So that that area became uh, an arena for Hezbollah attacks and infiltration attempts and abduction attempts uh, uh, in, yeah, in Russia. Correct. So in 2005, there was a major attempt. At, uh, so it was a security vulnerability, which is why, we, you know, Israel, uh, we, we see the FES being put there as well. 
2022, it, it's also because the, the village needed uh, economic support and, you know, they were trying to boost tourism and so on. So for whatever reason, also Allah having seen this and he waited on it from September 2022 till now, and now he, he sees that the moment is ripe for it, and he makes the move, and on cue, Hochstein comes to the region, on cue, uh, the Lebanese uh, official apparatus, the government, all play the same exact role that they played with the maritime. They present themselves as the negotiation, the negotiating uh, party. They relay, they interface with UDFIL and the U.S. They make the demand and so on. So, okay. So the United States is doing this. Why? I mean, that that's really the thing is that we're not used to this idea. Although with Lebanon, it's really been American policy, at least since Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State during the war in 2006, that the United States has really just adopted a uh, a policy that is based entirely on ba on burying their heads in the sand regarding Hezbollah's dominant role and preeminent role in Lebanon, its control over the Lebanese armed forces, which was evident during the war in 2006 when the Lebanese armed forces were providing targeting information to Hezbollah missile crews. Um, and rather than recoil from this, Condoleezza Wright at the time expanded U.S. support for the Lebanese armed forces in 1701, and subsequent to that, basing her policy, which was then adopted and expanded by Obama, was not canceled by Trump. And as you said, they they instigated again, reinstated these ridiculous maritime border negotiations. And then it was uh, it morphed into this, this policy that we'll get to with, with Biden. But I mean, the United States has had this long-standing bipartisan policy of ignoring that through Hezbollah, Iran has transformed Lebanon into a colony, and Hezbollah is there as the Leb as the Iranian, um, you know, high commissioner. Uh, they control all aspects of public life in Lebanon, their military, their intelligence services, and rather than contend with those, which, you know, most Americans probably assume, and certainly most Israelis assume the United States want to do, uh, because they're supposed to be against terrorism and against Iran, the United States is doing the exact opposite. So I want to go into a little bit of detail with you about just how deep the U.S., uh, support for sponsorship of these, uh, what what Barack Obama referred to as Iranian equities. Uh, he was not in Syria, but let's discuss them. No, it's, a, it's in Syria. It's in Syria, but it's an interesting thing because that's not, so you mentioned that they ignore that Hezbollah runs over. Sure, they ignore it, but they, it's not that they don't recognize it. They certainly do recognize it. And that's the point of, of uh, Obama's phrase about respecting Iranian equities. What does it mean to respect Iranian equities in Syria? What is the Iranian equity in Syria? What does, how does Assad. Syria, what, this... what, no, no, I, yeah, but what function does Syria have for Iran in the, re, in the region? Syria is the conduit for Iran to Lebanon. So when you're saying, I respect that, as your equity, you are explicit, implicitly, but really the point is explicit that I am respecting and recognizing the legitimacy of you keeping that conduit to Hezbollah in Lebanon. That's the whole point of it. Otherwise, what is the what is the value of Syria for Iran? Otherwise, it's it's booming economy, <laughs> it's vast reserves of oil. It's, it's zero. The only function of Syria for Iran is as a transit route and strategic depth for Hezbollah as a missile base against Israel. When the president of the United States says, I respect that, you are implicitly saying, I respect and recognize the other equity of Iran, Lebanon as a Iranian missile base aimed at Israel. Why, why did the United States do this? I mean, it makes no sense 
for from the naked eye for somebody looking at America as the leader of the free world and supposedly the government that's supposed to be leading the America the international uh, campaign to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear armed state and all the other things that American policymakers in every administration say as a matter of course. Um, and yet here they are. What is their relationship with the government of Lebanon, with the, with the, with the entity, with the Iranian equity, otherwise known as Lebanon? So, so the LAF, you mentioned the Lebanese army. The Lebanese army becomes the wonderful fig leaf, the perfect instrument for everyone to hide behind. So you, you cannot, like you said, like, you know, your, your just total revulsion at the idea that the United States is going to be in bed with Hezbollah somehow in Lebanon. It, it, it's, it's politically not feasible and nobody uh, in, in the administration I mean, is Richard going to openly- I mean, Richard Armitage, who was one of the most anti-Israel people in the, in the Bush administration, referred to Hezbollah after 9-11 as the A-team of global terrorism. So, I mean, the Americans have a long history until 9-11. Hezbollah killed more Americans than any other terrorist organization. And yet here is America. Sponsoring Hezbollah steps. Right. Now, I mean, you know, there, there, uh, Armitage belongs to a generation, obviously, that lived through uh, the 1980s, and there's a blood debt with Hezbollah, regardless of how they feel about Israel. But simultaneous with that sentiment is also a sentiment that always wanted to cut a deal with the Iranians uh, in that generation, right? And the idea that somehow if we uh, appease them and, 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 and maybe cut down, you know, Israeli belligerents, maybe then uh, they can they can uh, they can be brought around, but that, I, I don't want to really get into this. The point is to use the current um, to explain what they're doing currently, right? And part of what they're doing currently involves the LAF, right? So the LAF becomes an an excellent backdoor, like the whole concept of Lebanese state and government, and whatever fictional uh, mythological entities that we can talk about, uh, unicorns, whatever. I mean, all these things that don't exist really. And and uh, but they use the LAF as a vessel uh, and as a backdoor to a policy that extends American protection over Lebanon and implicitly by virtue of just the reality Hezbollah as well, right? So part of what they're doing uh, is then they can say, well, we're building a state institution in Lebanon that can stand as a counterweight, not in terms of any action it takes against Hezbollah, because they are not only not saying that they're actually opposed to the LAF playing that role. If you suggest to anybody involved in U.S. policy on the Hill or in, in any of the um, uh, uh, administration agencies, of Pentagon, whatever, you suggest, so much as suggest that the, LA, that the aid that we give to the LAF should be used in any way, tangibly, against Hezbollah, you would be not just laughed out, you would be attacked as someone who's trying to cause civil war in Lebanon because are you crazy? That will never happen. Now, they don't understand the contradiction in what they're saying, obviously, and they don't care. The point is, they use this gibberish talk to justify the policy. Now, Hezbollah and the LAF both understand this dance, right? That's why Hezbollah made sure to involve the LAF in the current campaign that they're running, right? So they bring, and it's very explicit, right? Nasrallah openly talks about it as, uh, he calls it a doctrine, right? The doctrine of deterrence against Israel. How, what is the doctrine? What does it involve? It involves, uh, it, it, it's three pronged. One prong, one prong is the, uh, the so-called resistance, i.e. Hezbollah. The other is the army, the Lebanese army. And three is what they call the people, meaning uh, the, the, the social environment, especially the one that's supportive of Hezbollah and how uh, they have this complementary role with the LF. Now, how do you see it? Whenever you see these attacks against the fence in Israel, for instance, you see local citizens and villagers. That's the people. Right, but they also brought in the LAF this time. The LAF comes in, moves beyond the blue line, pulls up their weapons against the IDF, poses for Hezbollah TV cameras, and 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 they do that in two, three spots, not just in one spot. Right, 
And that's the delivery. It's to show that the LAF, which is an American subsidized entity, okay, the current ambassador in Lebanon uh, came up, spearheaded uh, 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 an idea that set a precedent. It never existed ever before in American uh, assistance program to pay the salaries of the Lebanese armed forces and the internal security forces in U.S. dollars in cash, okay, to supplement their salaries to the tune of about $60 million for the next six months, okay? So that's 100,000 members, about 75,000 from the LAF and about 25, from about 20 maybe uh, from the ISF. And actually, from reading you, I learned that the ISF, the Internal Security Force, or the, is that right, the, the Intelligence Force, I mean, they basically, uh, with U.S. taxpayers footing the bill, they're essentially uh, a counterintelligence operation to, directed towards rooting out uh, Israeli spies, so that it's an anti-Israel intel operation that's being underwritten by U.S. taxpayers on a monthly basis, paying the salaries of 25,000 anti-Israel intel operatives controlled by Hezbollah, right, in Lebanon. It's insane. It's totally insane. And also, it's, I mean, it's basically illegal, which is why they came up with a half-baked precedent to try and, and, and because, you know, at first they wanted to use uh, a, an assistance program uh, uh, um, that's only intended for training and equipment. But they wanted to repurpose the funds in those accounts to in that account to pay salaries, and then they took that to Congress, and Congress said they can't do that. That's not legal. So they went back to the drawing boards with their lawyers, and they cooked up this ridiculous half-baked uh, solution. Um, they looked, at, you know, they scoured the earth for a precedent, and they found found one half-baked precedent involving Somalia where the United Nations was paying salaries, right, where the United Nations was paying salaries of the military within the African Union mission or whatever. And it wasn't even the U.S. that was paying salaries, it was the European that was paying salaries. But they used that, so to use the peacekeeper's operation account to pay money. Anyway, it's, it, it's, it was like, I, I say this only to explain the length that this administration has gone to underwrite a force and now, as Hezbollah was doing this campaign, the United States military was running a joint exercise with the LAF. And you had people, personnel from the Pentagon and the U.S. ambassador sitting with the LAF command that just a few days earlier was violating uh, uh, Resolution 1701, violating the Blue Line, violating Israeli sovereignty alongside Hezbollah operatives as Hezbollah was mounting operations on the lengths of the Blue Line. Okay, so that right. is so, what Los Angeles knows is the U.S. And, and position, aside from that, America why... also, but wait, and America is also arming them. It's not just that it's that yeah. it's funding oh, yeah. their 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 salaries. America is providing them with military platforms and ammunition. Right? I mean that that's Correct. the other thing. Yes. yes. And by the way, this was used in, in an incident. I say this because it's a relevant incident in this case uh, in 2010. Right. So. As Israel has moved to uh, fortify that blue line, right, by, uh, and turning it into a smart barrier, it includes uh, concrete, high concrete walls, and includes surveillance equipment and so on. As it do has done so, so subterranean, has, subterranean, uh, correct, uh, anti-penetration walls. Correct. We're well, leading, by the way, to the discovery of the tunnels in two late 2018, early 2019. In an area between Metula and Zare, where, uh, by the way, a lot of the current uh, probes that happened over the last couple of months, that's where they took place as well, right? So th there's a reason, and, and, and that included, by the way, operatives going up and, and snatching a camera from, from the Or just last okay? week that happened, right. Right. So that type of activity has been going on for, for years. And in 2010, as the IDF, was cutting down uh, trees. So what they ended up doing, they invented this uh, environmental group, Hezbollah did, which plants trees 
to block the cat, the surveillance camera so that they can have these activities. And then later they use that same group to build up towers overlooking the wall, surveillance towers overlooking. Now what's interesting is that Nasrallah said in his speech about the location of the tent, which by the way is very close to the Gladiola post, the idea of Gladiola, which is which was hit in that 2005 attack on Gaza. So he's he placed it in a in a place that has resonance in terms of Hezbollah operations in the area. And so in his speech, he said, we're free to do whatever we want here. We may we might want to build villas. We might want to build an airport. We might want to build towers, right? So that's a reference to the environmental group surveillance. So he is moving to establish tactical realities on the ground, even as he sets the United Nations states to go and do his bidding to force the Israelis to uh, pull out from uh, from Russia, from northern Russia. So, okay, so we have all of this U.S. that the United States knows that the Lebanese armed forces is controlled by Hezbollah. They know that Hezbollah is Iran's uh, government, essentially, uh, that controls Lebanon and uses it as a missile base directed against Israel. Um, they know all of this. They're funding all the same, the Lebanese Armed Forces, and now they're coming in and doing two things. One is they're trying to coerce the Netanyahu government into acting like the interim government under Lapid before the 2022 elections. And uh, they're saying that they want to de-escalate things and demanding that Israel not defend itself against uh, Lebanese aggression uh, carried out jointly between Hezbollah and Lebanese armed forces, and as if to make sure that everybody understands what they're talking about, while this aggression is being carried out by Hezbollah and LAF inside of sovereign Israeli territory, the U.S. ambassador and visitors from the Pentagon, from the U.S. armed forces, are are carrying out and observing uh, Lebanese armed forces, U.S. apparently joint. Uh, military war games that took place over nine days, I think, last week and this week uh, with the same forces that are attacking Israel. Right, because they view the LAF as a partner. They don't view the LAF as an auxiliary force to Hezbollah. They maintain the fiction, whether or not they believe it, it doesn't really matter. They maintain the fiction that Hezbollah is a counterbalance, which actually, if you think about it, is a completely wonderfully meaningless word. What does it mean to counterbalance Hezbollah exactly? It's one of those words that has that sounds really sophisticated and heavy, but actually has zero meaning. Uh, and 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 when you actually probe them as to what the hell are you talking about? What does that even mean to counterbalance? Well, what it is is it takes away from Hezbollah's narrative that it is the descender of Lebanon. Because now the LAF can be the descender of Lebanon. It's it's gibberish, really. I mean, and and so, but that's that's the that's the foundation of it. Um, but the the point the point is that they to go back to your to your to your initial point about the equities, right? If you start by saying, look, uh, the equities and the de-escalation, those are two important buzzwords. If you start by by taking that Obama statement seriously, if they view Iran, uh, Lebanon as an Iranian equity that that America vows to respect, and B, if your point is to de-escalate the region, which means to prevent anything that could lead to a larger conflagration, which really means to completely discourage and even so far as constrain Israel from taking action uh, and encourage any impulse of self-deterrence in Israel against taking any action. Now, by the way, I, the, the Israeli government may decide that the best way to handle these, this tent is not to necessarily blow it up. I mean, there are a million ways, other ways of doing it. But the point is, uh, uh, the oh, everything that the United States has taken, it, all the steps that they've taken in Lebanon, especially the maritime deal, were very specifically sold as two things. One as de-escalation and maintaining the security of Lebanon as well of Israel, right? And and two, 
they sold that maritime deal as part of their big reg um, uh, regional initiative, which they call regional integration. Right. Right. So now, wait, before we what, get into that, I want to I just I want to lead up to this for a second. OK. And, okay. and just hold that. So I want to I want to talk about that for a second. So when we talked about when I started it on and I said, you know, Condoleezza Rice was the one who really started us out of this road with the U.S sponsoring the Lebanese armed forces, the Lebanese government, despite the fact that it was very apparent that they were uh, a subordinate Hezbollah, which is, of course, an Iranian uh, foreign legion of the IRGC, et cetera. Um, but, and, that, uh, and that Obama massively expanded it. Trump administration did not reverse it. They maintained it. Um, and, but now um, Biden is doing something that is along the lines of Obama, but it's more than that. So you were just about to start explaining it, and I just wanted to put it into a framework to make clear that we're talking about something that's on the one hand a continuation of what preceded it, but it's also it's also has new aspects to it that are very dire. There, there is there is something new, although it's not new in terms of a departure. It's new as kind of the logical conclusion of of the Obama policy, because the the whole the, uh, Obama understood. See, the the Bush people and the same people that came from the Bush people in the Trump administration uh, had uh, a really um, to put it. As respectfully as I can, a gullible. They were whacked out. View. That was what you wanted to say. Yeah. That was your that that's, was your respectful gu way. Gullible. Let's put. Let's let's use gullible. They were gullible in terms of their thinking about Lebanon and Lebanese institution and the LAS. Uh, has uh, uh, Obama does not share that gullibility. Uh, Obama had a strategic vision. He wasn't really. Uh, he didn't really care about these people's fantasies in Lebanon. But when he says, I respect Iranian equities, and the Bush team give, get, had given him the perfect vehicle to, to actualize that, we are using the LAF as a partner in the war on terrorism. That became an excellent vehicle to now start pumping money to the LAF and signaling to the Iranians that we actually recognize their interests and we will protect them and even fund them in a place like Lebanon, right? Now, you take that and now the next step is what? If this is a, if Lebanon is a special province that we recognize as an Iranian holding, but we also extend our own protection to, uh, what's the best way to, um, and I have an article, by the way, on both these things, on all the stuff that we're talking about with the Hezbollah campaign that's coming out in Tablet and, and another one that, that's going to follow also in Tablet on this huge American embassy that's being built in Lebanon. A 43-acre campus on wait, a mountain top. That a, it's an embassy or it's an intelligence hub, which was the other insane thing. I thought that it was an intelligence hub. That no, they had. no, it's a, it's a, that's just, they're selling it. There is no intelligence hub in that. Whoever wants to sell that, whether it's from uh, people who, who, who want to put a, a target on the embassy or if it's the Americans themselves who are trying to aggrandize the importance of putting a 43-acre, $1 billion embassy in a terrorist-run non-state, okay? They're going to try to sell it as, oh, it's really important for intelligence. It's not. That's not what it is. Uh, it's that's just gibberish. Uh, but what it is is a signal that America is planting its flag in Hezbollah land, and therefore all of the benefits of having the American protective umbrella, uh, which all we saw in the maritime deal and uh, the call for increased investments in Lebanon and so on and so forth, all of that is now a sign to the Iranians that hey. This little province of yours, we're going to build our biggest embassy here next to the Baghdad embassy uh, that we have. And another of one of your equities, incidentally, uh, if, of your IRGC holding. We're going to put one right here in Hezbollah. And that's what that means. It means that, uh, do you think that we will look kindly on the Israelis coming and laying waste 
to Lebanon and the LAF and anything uh, that 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 poses as a fictional state institution in in the in the event of another war with Hezbollah. No. Will I, the... will Republicans in the House fund this? I mean, is this something oh, that you can? Ex- What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Republicans are totally on board uh, with funding the LAF. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the exception of one Republican. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz, who understands that this is lunacy, uh, but but uh, there are plenty of Republicans who think this is a swell idea. So let's go for a second. So so, but where were we? So so we were, we were talking about what, regional United... integration, right? So so right. if the United States says that this is something we protect, what is the Biden? So it ta- we recognize the Iranian equities. We're investing in Iranian equities. What next? We're going to call our allies, A, to not attack, not only not attack these Iranian missile bases, but also actually integrate them in the region, fund them, prop them up. So what that uh, targets are two allies, obviously, Israel, uh, with the maritime deal as a prime example. I'm not making this up. You can go back to October of 2022, and there's a briefing. Uh, with two senior officials, one of which is very obviously Hochstein and then uh, and someone else within, um, uh, in which, a- as they're introducing the briefing, the senior uh, White House officials introduces the maritime agreement as a prime example of President Biden's uh, policy of regional integration in the region. Ba- uh, President Biden, or an op-ed under President Biden's, with President Biden's byline in the Washington Post, prior to a security summit in Jeddah, uh, further elaborated on who and what it sees as this regional integration. It included that word three times in the op-ed and and proceeded to provide examples of regional integration. What were the examples? You would think, because now this word is being used to imply Uh, a continuation of the Abraham Accords by integrating Israel with other Arab states in a U.S.-led coalition facing Iran. That's only, that's the sleight of hand. What it actually means, as explained in that op-ed, in the Washington Post op-ed, is is having U.S. allies reach out to de-escalate and fund and integrate Iranian, other Iranian assets. So it's specific, Jeddah is in Saudi Arabia, so they were asking the Saudis to, they were uh, applauding the Saudis on their opening to Iraq and all of the deals w- that they're having with Iraq. Uh, on the P- on de-escalation in Yemen, which we, you know, and basically winding down the war with the IRGC in Yemen. And three, urging uh, Saudi Arabia to fund uh, the Lebanese armed forces and security services. Uh, that was the, the 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 statement of the Jeddah that that the United States wrote the section on Lebanon and 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 basically fed to uh, imposed on it and it, and it's the longest section. Can you imagine the United States forces the longest section of a security summit, Arab security summit, and dedicates it to have to encouraging Saudi Arabia to fund Hezbollah's the Hezbollah state. It almost makes you wish that they were asking them to fund Hamas. So that's the thing. They really want them to, uh, to, to, this is so they, like they did with the Israelis with the maritime deal, they want the Saudis to also start underwriting uh, the Lebanese, uh, um, uh, the Lebanese uh, special province that they have shared with the Iranians, basically. That's what regional integration is. So that policy requires, like you mentioned, de escalation. Don't don't uh, rock the boat in Lebanon. If there's a way to resolve this, resolve it. If look, if you if you need to withdraw from Gaza, withdraw from Gaza. If you need to take down that fence, take down that fence, uh, and so on. So that that becomes. But then you need to uh, make Hezbollah happy because de-escalating means appeasing Hezbollah for the next five minutes until they ask for we something don't, yeah, else, we don't want which more. we're going to support. So that you can de-escalate after they've escalated. I mean, that's that, basically, that basically what de- becomes it. I mean, yeah. cor- correct, correct. De-escalation is you. Uh, Lebanon is off limits. You don't bomb in Lebanon. Now, 
the problem is that this has been Israeli policy for the last decade, more or less, right? Israel had agreed to rules of engagement that bypass Lebanon and focus on Syria instead. For Again, I'm no military strategist, so I'm not going to pretend to know what is a good military strategy for Israel to pursue uh, uh, you know, in its planning. But the point is, there, what, what there is no doubt about is that this has come at a cost, and the cost is a complete erosion in Israeli deterrence and the emboldenment of Hezbollah. Then you add the United States inserting itself in, in the middle, and now you have a problem. And Hezbollah is using that precedent and pushing and pressing its advantage. So uh, Israel has to now decide. Uh, how, you know, it, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to bomb or go to war or anything of that nature. I mean, there are people in Israel, funny enough, they were the same cheerleaders of the maritime deal who are now saying that, oh, the IDF should, you know, deal Hassan Nasrallah a big uh, punch in the nose, right? Without mentioning, without mentioning the cost to Israeli deterrence of the maritime deal, of course. But so, so you're, there are voices in Israel who are calling for this. But that's not really my point here. My point is, if Israel thinks that going through the United States in Lebanon is, an, is a good idea that will constrain Hezbollah, it doesn't understand the U.S. role in Lebanon. The U.S. role in Lebanon is not about constraining Hezbollah. The U.S. role in Lebanon, as the maritime deal shows, is about constraining Israel in Lebanon. So, okay, and and one of and so if in October of 2022. The United States was able to use the fact that we had an interim government that was going to expire, uh, come what may, uh, after the November 1st elections uh, in order to squeeze Yair Lapid to succumb to Hezbollah's demands. Now they have ostensibly a much more powerful government, a stable government, governing coalition under Benjamin Netanyahu with a clear governing majority in the Knesset which opposed the maritime deal and which opposes appeasement of Hezbollah as a general principle. Um, and here we've seen that this government not only has not had one minute since it entered office in order to put together a coherent strategy for dealing with our northern border and then executing it, we have seen chaos in Israel reigning in the streets day in and day out and at nighttime since the government uh, came into office and the American government under the Biden administration is on the side of the anarchists that are trying to tear Israel apart, trying to tear the IDF apart, trying to tear the Israel Air Force apart uh, at every stage of the game, whether it was Tom Knight, the ambassador who is now leaving, or President Biden, or Secretary of State uh, uh, Tony Blinken, the Americans have stood four square with the forces of chaos that are trying to bring the government of Israel to its knees. So, um, and do you see a connection between what's happening in the North and what the American ambassador and the White House are doing inside of Israel? So it's interesting to me to watch how Iran and its assets behave how they read uh, the posture. So I mentioned when we started, and this is a good way to wrap the whole conversation. Like when I when we started the conversation, I said this goes back to 2021, right? 2021 and the war in Gaza. 2021, that war and it's was guardian the of first, the wall. Correct, the guardian of the walls. That was the first major conflagration in Gaza for the last for the almost the whole uh, Trump term. Where I mean, you had a few skirmishes, but you didn't really have a major war, right? And there was a reason for the for first that. time, just to put in parentheses, just so that everybody remembers, Guardian of the Walls, it was ostensibly between the IDF and Hamas in Gaza. But actually, this was the first time we've seen Arab Israeli citizens play an active role in an enemy campaign against the Jewish state where they they committed mass pogroms against Jews in mixed Arab uh, Jewish cities throughout the country. Uh, and against uh, highways and uh, and, uh, and 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 passages to air force bases in the south and other things. So this was something that we had we had not experienced in Israeli history, and they were operating in tandem with 
uh, Hamas in Gaza. But what was interesting about that war, though, is is its framing. And the framing did not come from the Palestinians. The Palestinians are instruments. That's their history. That's always what they were and what's always what they're going to be. Um, instruments, the, did the, you say? The, yes, instruments of, of, of regional powers, what? regional states, right? So um, so they the, the framing of that war came from Tehran including from Lebanon too. I mean, I don't separate these two things, obviously, from the Iranians, basically, right? Um, and the way they phrased it was very interesting. Uh, Khamenei said that there's a new balance of power now, that basically, because it was that war, war was framed as an opposition and a rejection of the path of, of, of the Abraham Accords. That's how they framed it, okay? And they said, now there's something new. Why? Oh, why would the leader of Iran and the leader of the of Hezbollah, his subordinate, believe that there was a shift now that the that the Obama team had returned and the Trump team had left for them to make that push? And why, even after, well after uh, the Trump administration had recognized, as opened the embassy in Jerusalem and recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan, which saw zero action. Why did the action start now? So these guys have a way of reading America's posture in the region, right? And they take advantage and they press and they sometimes they, you know, they even dance with it uh, and uh, to their advantage. So I think that just as you saw that in 2021, you're now seeing uh, the same way. They read the posture of the United States government towards the Netanyahu government. Uh, they read, just as they read, for instance, Nusrallah read the Lapid government when it rotated. It, it didn't do it when, when Bennett was in power. They did it when Lapid came to power, right? For whatever, I'm not, I'm just, I, they're, I'm pointing to chronological points and facts, like, and you have to explain them. And then the other thing, you know, now we have this, and now all of a sudden, as this happens, and as the Americans are openly trashing the Abraham Accords in favor of returning the Palestinians to the center of Israel's relations with the Arabs, all of a sudden, the, the, the whole situation in the West Bank blows up, right? And now you have that element, and now you have the pressure on that, and now you have the Aqaba form, and the Amman form, and the Negev form. And let's bring back the Palestinians and let's refocus everything on the Palestinians. And then, of course, there's the internal uh, domestic uh, stuff in, in, in Israel where the United States really bizarrely starts intervening in domestic politics, of, of a, which doesn't happen anywhere. I mean, the kind, this kind of language and posture, we are reserved to, you know, enemy states and, and, and autocracies and, and so on, that kind of language, you know, consensus. We use that in Lebanon. I mean, that's the kind of language you use it. So obviously, um, and then of, of course, you know, seeing all this stuff about reservists and pilots and whatever. I, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to speculate, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that at some level, you know, as Allah sees this and says, well, you know, might as well push it. Uh, you know, what's what's? Uh, it's unlikely that they're going to make a big push while they're having, you know, multiple fronts. Uh, they're already deterred in Lebanon for all this time. The Americans seem to be okay with this uh, with, with this push in Lebanon. Why not? You know, let's it will. And if and if there is a fo uh, you know a, a forceful retaliation, okay. So we'll we'll live through a few days of fighting. Who cares? And then and then we go back to you know we go back to normal. So it's it's a it's a it's a reasonable gamble on the part of Hezbollah reading the 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 map, reading where the Americans are. And reading where this right now, the government, the Netanyahu government has, Galant has said it, and I think uh, Arti Halevi has said it, that that Hezbollah is making misreadings, that that they think they know how we're going to react, but actually they don't because we might do it. Now, that may, they may be true, but until that happens, right, Hezbollah is going to continue with its reading because until proven, until proven otherwise. So whether or not there is such a debate, and you hear that, you know, that there's a debate in the IDF about it. Uh, there was a piece in, I think Yossi Yoshua wrote about it, that there's a big uh, um, debate in the IDF whether it's time to actually, that, that, that there's a dangerous erosion in deterrence. 
it's time to remind Masallah through a limited escalation, right? Not nothing huge that that you know that he cannot, you know, to draw a line again and so on. Whether or not they decide to do that after this whole thing with the now that the the law has passed and maybe things maybe die down a little bit if they die down, maybe they'll consider it just to show to make the point. I don't know. I mean, we, we will see. We will see uh, because if if not. If this, uh, if Hezbollah's provocation is not only not responded to, but rewarded with, uh, you know, let's say the dismantling of the fence or the return of the, uh, or the withdrawal from Gaza or uh, demarcating the blue lines, con points of contention that the Lebanese claim, whatever the case may be, right? All of these things uh, obviously will not, will not be, will not be good for restoring deterrence in, in any way. Right. So, I mean, I think that what we're seeing then, again, I mean, I think just to bring it back, there's this sense that, um, you know, how how Hezbollah interprets it or not, I mean, I think that what we're seeing is that we had a very weak Israeli government, an interim government that had already fallen uh, last year. The United States swooped in and compelled it to, to heal and to accept Hezbollah's term in the maritime deal. And now we have what is ostensibly a very stable government, but it's reeling under this U.S.-supported insurrection that's now been going on for seven months. And, I mean, even today, after the Knesset passed uh, one part of the uh, reform package, President Biden responded by, you know, uh, voicing his displeasure with Israeli democracy actually working with the Knesset passing a law that it was elected to pass. And so there's no end to this. And in the meantime, they're working here. So it it feels, it feels like, you know, they're trying to bring pressure to bear that will, that will weaken the government while they're, while they're, their equity in Lebanon is working with Hezbollah, Iran's equity in Lebanon, uh, to to seize territory, some right. of which is sovereign Israeli territory, some of which is disputed, some of which is Israeli territory as recognized by the United States, Correct. where it recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, et cetera, 100%. et cetera. So all of this is happening while the United States is supporting the destabilization of the Israeli government. So, like I said, Nasrallah was very explicit in how he conceptualized the role the U.S. is going to play in this in this gambit of his, right? Uh, and he modeled it. I mean, this is very explicit. People can go check it out. It's a speech that he gave on July 12th. I'm not making it up. Uh, he conceptualized it very uh, openly, explicitly, uh, uh, modeled after the maritime deal. We, Hezbollah does X, the Americans do X, the Israelis do X. That's what, that's, that's how he, that's how he presented it. He, he, he knows what he's going to do. He anticipates what the Americans are going to do and he anticipated correctly. Uh, and then three, he thinks that the result is going to be the same like it was with America. Now that is still the, the X factor. We don't know if that's going to be the case because there are, like I said, the, the, the Israeli government, not can ignore that for a while and take care of it later. It doesn't have to take care of it now. It can de-escalate now if the Americans so wish and 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 focus elsewhere. But it but uh, but the most important thing is not to allow that to set the new precedent. That's the whole point. The maritime deal set a precedent. This cannot be set as a precedent on land. That's going to be very dangerous because what they're trying to do is both. Again, you know, establishing the idea that the United States now stands in between equidistant Hezbollah and Israel, number one, very dangerous. That's the maritime deal's legacy. And number two, um, it's setting up something potentially operational that now we can start working in that eastern sector again, the way we did between 2000 and 2006 in, in the Hardob area. And, and three, remember, you mentioned just a few minutes ago, that the Trump administration recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan. The Obama team was never happy about that recognition. 
Uh, they, they didn't have not disavow. Been a, they didn't disavow it. They're doing so with the Jerusalem side. So they're reinstating the 67 uh, standard in Jerusalem, which obviously, if you're going to extend it in Jerusalem, it's, it's the Obama legacy of UN Security Council uh, Resolution 2334, which adopts the 67 lines everywhere, right? So if that's the case, then now all of a sudden you're... Uh, Potentially, you're seeding the seeds of reviving the Trump recognition of the lot via the back door of Lebanon. I'm not saying that they're going to do that now, but if Hezbollah gets away with this precedent and the, and the Israeli government uh, entertains it through some sort of a diplomatic uh, mediation with the United States, I'm not talking about Shema, I'm talking about Gaza, the stuff that's... Masal has not an idiot. He understood the weak point. The weak point is Gaza, because that's that's the one that he has uh, uh, the strongest saying, uh, the strongest footing for. Uh, or the blue line, you know, hey, why not? Let's let's work with Unifil to demarcate the last 13 points on the blue line, blah, blah, blah. That sounds reasonable. Let's send that. Uh, you know, if, if you get locked down with this and then Hezbollah slowly but surely begins to operationalize the Mount Dove area in, uh, and then drags in the United States into that into that uh, operation, then you're opening the door to something very, very bad and very ugly. So what, however the Israeli government deals with this particular episode with the tents now, if it delays it if, it, if it leaves it alone until it takes care of other things, the point is do not enter into a diplomatic process with the United States and Lebanon. The United States and Lebanon is not siding with you. The United States is extending a protective umbrella over Lebanon, which de facto means a protective umbrella against Hezbollah. They want de-escalation in Lebanon. They want concessions if possible. They want quiet and integration and all of that stuff. So if the if the thinking in Israel is still the way, you know, like the old thinking, well, we'll ask the United States to pressure this and pressure the LAF and do that, complete waste of time. Do not fall into that trap, the mediation trap. That, I think, is, is the key uh, thing that if this government avoids, irrespective of how it ends up dealing with the situation, whether through a reassertion of, uh, you know, of deterrence through force or through just simply ignoring as it focuses on, let's say, the Iranian nuclear program or a strike or whatever, um, the point is not to fall into the the part two. We started by talking about this as a continuation of the maritime. Do not continue the maritime deal on land. That's that's the key. Okay, I, I want to round it out. And so before I say thanks, Tony, I'll have you back later. Let me just ask you one question. Uh, this is a total hypothetical, but just to get a sense of it. If tomorrow uh, Hezbollah started shooting um, its missiles at Israel, there's 150,000, it can ostensibly shoot 3,000 a day and completely cripple Israel. So you have the United States there that is it's sponsoring the LAM, that is working as an auxiliary force to Hezbollah. Can the United States, is it in a position and would it be willing, do you think, to get involved with compelling Hezbollah to stop? Um, the, the United States does not have... Her directly uh, would deter Hezbollah in Lebanon from attacking Israel. Uh, well, the way they're thinking about it is that if they're thinking in, ter in materialistic terms, right? So like if you give them wealth, they'll have something to lose. That's how they sold the maritime deal, right? Clearly, they don't care about that. Or if they do, they're confident in the United States being more and France being more invested than they are, right? So that they're the ones who are going to rush to try to protect those investments by asking the Israelis to hold back and so on. So no, I don't... The United States does not have on the ground in Lebanon, does not have the the tools to like you know the laf is not a tool to constrain Hezbollah. that's just a joke right the, the, the laf if anything will join uh in a supportive role with alongside hezbollah um so and and the other 
levers of pressure, which are very considerable, that the United States has with Iran or or with Lebanon as as, as territory, it is unwilling to use uh, because it views them as counterproductive. That somehow, you know, what's the point of breaking the state and causing state collapse in Lebanon? That will hurt Israel. It's not good for Israel, etc., etc., etc. So the posture and all the premises of U.S. policy in Lebanon actually dictate against it. So where do you go? You can't do it with Hezbollah. So you go to Israel and you tell the Israelis, don't attack. Right? That's why, you know, the guys in Israel who sold this ridiculous argument that having a rig here for Lebanon and a rig here for Israel creates mutual deterrence. And that's a good thing. That was the most absurd line of argument that that was made in in favor of the maritime deal. Can you imagine Israel targeting a French operated or a Qatari operated rig inside Lebanon as part of its deterrence? It's absurd. So the only place Basically, that the, only the place whole the idea pressure is, is, uh, is, is Israel. The only pressure point is Israel. So Israel Correct. shouldn't be deluding itself also with the concept that American sponsorship of the LAF is somehow or another going to compel the United right. States to put its foot down on behalf of Israel uh, in Lebanon. That's just not going to happen. It signals a protective umbrella for Lebanon. It does not signal a protective umbrella for Israel. When the United States plants its flag Which is why in it's Hezbollah not land. Equidistant. It's not equidistant, as you mentioned, between no, Israel that's the and Lebanon. No, no, it, it positions itself as a mediator. But we saw what happened with the maritime deal. It didn't make requests from Lebanon to abandon its claim. Exactly. Exactly. All right. And 0% of Israel. All right. Well, uh, Tony, we had a lot of other things we wanted to talk about, but I think we talked about that a lot. And uh, and I really appreciate it. I think, you know, it's so important because part of the feeling that I have, you know, and I'm getting sucked into the domestic issues as well. I'm writing a book about it right now, but it's uh, but it it's so important to keep our eye on the prize, which is defending Israel against Iran and its proxies, first and foremost, uh, Hezbollah-controlled Lebanon. So I think, you know, this was, it seems like, why why would you have a show about Lebanon this week of all weeks? And the answer is, if you want to hear my news analysis about what's happening in Israel, that's a separate show and it's going to come out the day after this show does. So uh, you stay tuned there, but we have to keep our eyes on the wider picture and the strategic realities that we're operating in as Israel goes mad. Um, or at least the left does. And uh, so thank you so much, Tony, for coming on again. Um, and we're doing this really late at night, so staying awake for this. I appreciate that. And it's guys, my pleasure. Um, my pleasure. And, and guys, don't forget, if you haven't subscribed, that's not good. You should have subscribed by now. It's like <laughs> show number 100 and a lot. So just, you know, subscribe already. And, and, uh, and we'll see you again next week. So thanks a lot, Tony, and take care, guys. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks very much.